Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Damon Cabildo. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll cover a talk by financial advisor Richard Wertheimer at the monthly meeting of the Harvard Club. He is well familiar with business in China and gave us an in-depth look at how its economy affects global markets. Richard's background gives him a unique perspective into this important but often baffling topic. He is originally from New York, but has lived and worked in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan for the last 30 years. As one of the first Americans to live in China after the restoration of its diplomatic ties with the West, he is one of a handful of Westerners who has been witness to and a participant in China's remarkable transition from a planned economy to a market economy. He has been on the ground in China and Asia during this extraordinary period of the region's development, and this has given him a special insight into China's role in our increasingly interconnected world. Richard divides his time between the U.S. and Asia, managing a global asset portfolio at Morgan Stanley. At his talk at the Harvard Club, Richard was introduced by his Morgan Stanley colleague, Dean Spagnoli, and Archie Kale, program director at the club. I graduated from high school in New York in 1982 and uh, decided to seek my fortune in China um, and learn Chinese. And I went off in 1983 um, uh, to learn Chinese. And I got to China, and I had no problem getting in. And, and I was there for a little while, and I said I wanted to stay. And they said, you can't, because back then it was fairly closed, particularly if you were a, a, you had to have a student visa. And so they said, well, I, I want to learn Chinese. And they said, well, you have to go to Taiwan. And I, I said, I don't want to learn Thai. I want to learn Chinese. So I was, I was, I was not very well informed. I was young and, and impressionable, to say the least. Um, so I've taken a rather non-conventional approach to China. I've never really studied it as a historian. And, and I, I think there are reasons for that. And there are very few historians today. Um, and that's got to do with the fact, I think, when the Chinese Communist Party came in, they really did some uh, a severe house uh, uh, housekeeping and cleansing of the historical past. And so that's just, a, 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 I'd say, a side note. I was in uh, Taiwan for a number of years. I did a number of very uh, crazy things. I drove a taxi. I was probably the first and probably the only foreigner to drive a taxi in Taipei. I played rugby for the uh, national Taiwan team. Um, yeah, and, uh, and I went and I took the Chinese entrance exam uh, in Taiwan. It's called the Liankao, and I guess in, in China, the Gaokao. Uh, and I failed miserably. Um, but they thought it was so strange that this little foreigner wanted to, to be in the university. They said they let me in. So I, I, I guess the reason why I bring this up is, is I, my approach has not been, has been one of just trying to be on the ground, um, like I mentioned, trying to be more Chinese than the Chinese, uh, until one day I realized that um, Chicken feet, no. Hamburgers, yes. Um, I still do chicken feet, but uh, I kind of, you realize that it's, it's you, you, yeah, as a foreigner, you're a foreigner and you can't change that. The main criteria for understanding what's happening in China is whatever it takes to keep the Chinese Communist Party in power. And then from there, try to analyze and understand what that means. So if something happens in the South China Sea or China makes a, an announcement about something, it's always, I'm always trying to think about what does that mean for the, the China's Communist Party to stay in power? And the, the formula that I, I use for that or that I borrow from a friend of mine, Frank Hawk, who is the Stanford, uh, head of the Stanford Business Center in Beijing, and it was, it was part of the original eight students that go into China in the late 70s, is uh, it calls it the three Bs. And it's basically uh, belief, butter, and bullets. And what what the belief stands for is legitimacy. So uh, how does, in order to stay in power, they have to be, it has to have some form of legitimacy. And obviously because they're not voted in, then that is, uh, is even more important uh, by the people. They have to see that they're, that they're getting something for, giving, for, for, for letting them basically maintain power. The, 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 the hot topic today is anti-corruption and the parties, uh, uh, attempt or, or uh, initiatives to basically uh, uh, minimize or, or eradicate corruption within the party, uh, which is extremely difficult because it's endemic in the system. And in some ways, uh, if the anti-corruption drive continues the way it is today, it'll actually end up right on his front door because it's, it's so inherent in the system that uh, you have to ask yourself, while it's, a, it's the right thing to do, that it's, it's, it almost poses a risk to the, to the power themselves. 
uh, but it is something they have to do in order to maintain legitimacy because your average person, uh, if, if, if they don't feel, if the people don't feel that they're getting, um, if, the, if the power the be and they continue to enrich themselves uh, in, in, a, in a corrupt way, that's obviously not good. Um, the other part of legitimacy is the, and we're seeing this more and more, and when I was first in China, you didn't see it so much, but through foreign policy and nationalism. And again, if you pick, data doesn't go by where you pick up the newspaper and you see the South China sees the news that China is expanding there. Uh, the, the point on that, I would say primarily, uh, as well as uh, not 100%, not but a, a, a strong part of it, that this is posturing and pandering to the local audience. And again, it's for the people and it's so that the party can stay in power. So it's not so much that, that China is going out and aggressively trying to um, pick a war with the United States. Um, even though there is obviously that possibility if, as they continue in that trajectory. <coughs> Ideologically, uh, China, I think, is in a tricky spot. Um, Marxism, uh, and people look at China today as being a, are they, are they, is there any communism, is there any socialism left? The answer is Marxism is, is a Western uh, philosophy or ideology. It's not Chinese. Uh, it really doesn't uh, fit with, um, with uh, and it's not realistic. I would say those two things are probably important. So what else does, do they have? They have uh, neo-Confucianism, which I think is a stretch, uh, trying to bring their, they are trying to fill that void. Uh, you've got uh, the Chinese dream, which Xi Jinping, current president, is like the American dream, is trying to uh, manufacture, but it's hard to manufacture something like that. I mean, the American dream wasn't dreamt up by a couple of guys in a room. It happened and evolved naturally. Um, Christianity is, is uh, a huge area of, uh, of concern for the party, and they estimate there's probably about 100 million Christians in China today. Um, so there's really this void, and I think that's what you're seeing with Christianity. It's not that it's a natural fit for China, but people are looking for something, and the problem is when you rip out the heart of old China, and I think Taiwan is different. Anybody who spent time in Taiwan, or Hong Kong for that matter, uh, but really Taiwan, you'll see that there is still uh, a, a, a connection with the past, and in China it's less so. And, and, and there really isn't much of a viable alternative. So that's the belief. In terms of butter, uh, that is really the economic contract, the bread and circus of Rome. And that had been working for a long time, and right now it's fair enough to say that, that things are, are not as rosy as they used to be. Um, and it's, it's, if, if you go to China and you talk to people and you take taxis, often the taxi drivers, I'll ask them, how are things for them, and, and how are they seeing things, and how's their family? Um, often comes back, the comment is that their kids can't afford uh, to buy a place. Um, and so that the, it, it's, it's uh, and that people, it's harder to make money. And the, 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 the things before were easier, particularly with the export economy, and that, that's, that the export competitiveness is declining. It's just net-net, that economic contract is becoming a little bit shakier, and that's a problem. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit as well, but I'd say the, the solution in China to, and I'll, uh, about the, the, as the economy slows and this economic contract becomes at risk, uh, is ultimately a political one. Repression is definitely on the rise, um, and this goes hand in hand with, I think, what's happening in terms of the beliefs and the, 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 the economic issues. Uh, internet censorship, you've got domestic security budgets are still sky high, uh, equaling that of the military budgets in China. Um, it's, I spent, uh, I've done a lot of different stuff in China, but more recently I've been working with uh, some of the state-owned enterprises uh, in China, two in particular, one was Haitong Securities, they're the second largest broker in China, the other one is Jiangxi Copper. Um, and as we were working on uh, JVs and buying a stake in them, people weren't willing to take risks because of all of the, uh, the repression and the, the, the potential fallout for sticking your neck out too far. Um, uh, people would often disappear to have to go to not necessarily re-education camps, but having to do uh, interviews and where they'd have to put down basically what they've done or what they've committed. And uh, it, it, it is fairly rigorous system, so people would have on file what uh, uh, what naughty things you may have been up to. Xi Jinping, is, 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 is he goes through uh, grabbing power, um, he is cracking down on a number of different areas, contrary to what people thought when he first came in, uh, be it in education. Uh, they came out with a document called Number 9, where they went after the universities and said, 
Western values couldn't be taught and a whole other host of things. Um, uh, art, uh, they're, they're commenting on what type of art is acceptable and there's been a lot of news with um, uh, various artists and cracking down on them. I mean, I just, just even the other day I opened the newspaper and I saw a lawyer coming out of court and his, you could see his underwear, his pants had been ripped, his shirt was half off and he was in court for some reason and the police didn't like what he said or what he did and they beat him up. Um, which is, you know, one approach. Uh, <laughs> it's effective, I guess. Um, and it was I, I, that, that, you know, ultimately repression only goes so far. It's a very expensive tool to use. As is customary at the club, Richard's talk was followed by a Q&A with attendees at the meeting. She basically is looking to save the party because it's at risk. And in order to save the party, uh, part of what he has to do is basically this anti-corruption phase and to go after, um, to amass, in his view, to amass as much power as possible so he can drive through the reforms he needs to do. That's one narrative. And so these CEOs that are disappearing, some of them are related to different factions within the government, particularly those aligned to Jiang Zemin, who's sort of the biggest, the big patriarch and is, um, in a, uh, I would say, opposed to the measures that Xi Jinping is doing. So particularly as an example of that, and I've worked with some of these guys at China, uh, at, at uh, uh, Chinese Petroleum, Sinopec. These, that was group was, um, was under uh, uh, one gentleman in particular and was against Xi, and so he basically went after those guys and trumped up, tried, everybody's corrupt. I mean, if you want to go after somebody, you couldn't survive in China. The system almost forced you to be corrupt. I mean, and there have been examples of of uh, people trying to do it the right way and ending up in just a whole heap of trouble. And you say, you know what, forget it. If I can't beat them, join them. And so I think at the end of the day, if somebody wants to go after you on a corrupt charge, somehow, somewhere, they're going to get you. And I think that's what's happening a lot of these CEOs. So it's, it's real. When we talk about repression and the state of things today in China, I can tell you when I talk to my friends that are in Hong Kong, that are in China, that have spent time overseas, the intellectuals, the, these are, these are, these are um, successful folks, the, the voices are basically now gone silent. What's happening is, is the, it, this repression and this uh, is, is uh, stymieing any kind of reform. I mean, when, when she first came into power, people thought it was going to reform. I think it's safe to say at this point, in the next five years or six years of his tenure, I don't think he's going to change. I think his view is, I don't want to be the next Gorbachev. And the way to do that is basically to you know, bring down the hammer. And I guess to some degree, he's looking at Deng Xiaoping and what he did uh, during uh, Tiananmen and the crackdown there. Um, basically took a very strong approach and you know, it, it worked. You could argue one way or it didn't. Uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I'm sure there's an element of and, and it does scare me uh, that he is amassing so much power that and that's why I say there's been a lot of talk in the media and, and amongst uh, various groups saying that oh, he's, he's gathering power now so he can get these reforms through. Um, and there are a lot of different reforms we're talking about, but ultimately, yeah, he's keeping, he's keeping people down, but now he's keeping it down to the point where it's becoming, it, it's not a positive, it's really a negative. Um, and, and that goes back to both uh, political reform as well as economic reform. That's why I said ultimately the problem is political, because in order for the, and I'll get to this in a little more detail, but in order for the, the economic reforms to be implemented, uh, it really requires that the government themselves, the party itself, relinquishes a certain amount of control. And you have to understand the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is, is the second longest lasting regime around in the world uh, after Korea. And they are, I don't know what the word, freak controls, but they're addicts, they're addicted to this power. And it's very hard, you know, as this corruption is being endemic, it's hard to change uh, it, when it's in their DNA. And so it, it, there is, and then some of the, a lot of conclusions are reached that China is heading for, at a minimum, a bumpy road mm -hmm. and at a, the ultimate for a lot of people, they see this as really being in crisis um, and, and eventually regime change. Uh, I, I don't know if I agree with that, but that's, that's definitely a possibility. When you look at China on a comparative advantage point of view, in terms of land, labor, and capital, it's not really, they, they don't come out ahead on that. 
But uh, what, what ultimately, in terms of the new economy, in today's world, I would say that innovation and governance is actually more important. And, and, and China talks a lot, part of the reforms and stuff they want to do, they recognize these are not stupid people. They, they understand what's going on. They know what they need to, to do. The question is whether they have the, the wherewithal or the ability, the resources to do so. And particularly for innovation and governance. So that allows for sort of this new economy to, to uh, basically grow. As an American and as a country, I think you know, we're guilty of, of taking sort of democracy and our, our view of, 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 uh, of government um, our various philosophies or uh, religious beliefs and we kind of tend to push them on other places and I, I don't think that necessarily works in China uh, so I, I'm not sitting here saying that we should take that has to be the exact system but what I will say is this I will say that ultimately and to me this is sort of the crux of it is um, it's really the power of law and the ability to have an opportunity and that really has been the economic contract you know you get out of the leave us alone on the political side we'll let you make money and be you know, to get rich is glorious, as Doug said, right? So I think that's, and that's really the frustration. I think that if you talk to uh, a lot of people in China is that, and that was sort of the, 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 that example of that lawyer coming out of court being, you know, his clothes ripped apart. I mean, I, I think that's more damaging than anything. And if people don't have hope, where it's not, you don't get an equal shake. And then you look at the people in power, the party, you know, that are corrupt and they get, you know, they're, they're indemnified and do whatever they want, that's a problem and that needs to be addressed, which again, he's trying to do that. So I'm not, you know, it's, this stuff is not black and white and it's definitely, oh my God, it's not easy. You know, if you're talking about, you talk to people in China <laughs> or anybody from China and you try managing a country of one point, close to 1.4 billion people with some of the limited resources that they have, uh, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's extremely difficult. It's, it's easy for us to sort of throw, you know, to, to criticize it, but to actually do it's another, another sense. They fear political instability, they, they fear instability, period, which stops them from making the, ref the reforms that they need to do, whether it's political or economic, and obviously those are both related. So that's, that, that is why, again, this whole sort of power, uh, his, the, the starting point for, for Xi to basically amass power makes sense, to, to be legitimate and also so he can control. When I first went there and I look at it today and with the, the change, it's, just, it's phenomenal. It is, it is mind-blowing. What they have achieved, and um, you know, even Larry Summers, uh, president of Harvard, uh, president, right? Is he president? Former. Former, former, sorry, former, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, a, a pit stop. So he... Um, he, he made a comment saying that the, the, that the China over the last 30 years is the third most important economic event in the last 500 years after the Industrial Revolution and the uh, Renaissance. And he's right. I mean, you know, I, I just look at it from what I've seen. I remember going to Pudong, which is on the east side of the Pu River, uh, Pu Xi River, uh, Pu River, sorry, uh, which runs through Shanghai. And I, I was there, <laughs> I don't know if you saw it back then or anybody else, it was just fields. There was nothing there. And I went to this company called Lu Jiazui, which was the area within, now developed in, within, within <laughs> Pudong. And they had this model, uh, and, it, and it's really, it was in a, one of those buildings, corrugated buildings, it was just uh, thrown together. And the model had all these big, beautiful skyscrapers, it wasn't even that beautiful, just all these things sort of helped to skelter, and this massive city, and I said, this is what we're gonna build. And I'm like, yeah, right, that's not gonna happen. Sure enough, you go to China today, it's gone beyond what I mean. When you go there, it is the future. And this is what I think a lot of people, I'm sure most of you here either can feel this or have seen this or been part of it, but it is shocking. And if, if anybody here has not been to Shanghai in particular, Beijing as well, but Shanghai, you gotta go. I mean, that is, it is, it is a, there's this antiquated view in the West and the US in particular, as far as the, 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 the business that I'm in, uh, and I've seen this empirically not, uh, time and time again, of, they have this image of China as old China, uh, that it hasn't changed and it's not the future <laughs> and, the, and they're not aggressively changing. And so, so there was this, almost this tale of two worlds. And, and they're both, the, the, not that one's right and one's wrong, um, but it just, it, it shocks me. And I guess one of the things I really want to leave as a conclusion here is that when, you know, despite what happens in China and what your conclusions may be, whether the regime falls apart, the economy blows up, whether it slows from 
6% growth to 3% growth or below, there's a hard landing or a soft landing, uh, it, it doesn't matter. We as Americans uh, have to recognize that it is the second largest economy in the world. It will be the first largest economy in the world. Um, it is, it's just, it, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, and it's growing regardless. Um, it accounts for, uh, in many cases, 50% of the world's, uh, of the imports of co various commodities, exports, something like 30% of the world's exports. So it's, I mean, I can throw a bunch of statistics at you, but ultimately you can't ignore it. And so that's really what, what sort of my, one of my conclusions is, regardless of what you believe, you have to pay attention. We have to get educated. And it's happening, it is happening. I mean, the US, um, Maybe we don't see it in, in, in all areas, but and I think you know, in some areas like the military is spending a lot more time looking at China and confronting China, and we're seeing it in the South China Seas. And I, th I think we're gonna see the US approach to China is changing. I think it's morphing. Um, cyber security, uh, and you, again, this, we don't always see this stuff, and I'm not privy to any of this stuff, but my sense is that we are starting to react. Um, I, my hope is that China is smart and continues to follow more of Deng's approach of a, uh, of, of a, of a more balanced growth and doesn't challenge the U.S. and doesn't do silly things. I don't think they will. That's not their motive. Again, their motive is to stay in power, and I think they're really, their attention is on, the, on, their, on their domestic audience. It's not to challenge the U.S. Um, I, I definitely do not see in any way, shape, or form China challenging uh, the U.S.'s preeminence uh, in terms of the world system. I think over, over time that could change, but I don't think that that's something we have to worry about. What we have to worry about more is, is China going to be uh, at risk of uh, economic and political instability? Because that will affect us, um, for sure. Thanks to Richard for this talk. We appreciate the opportunity to share in the programs organized by the Harvard Club. If you want to know more about the club, see hchawaii.clubs.harvard.edu. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. And then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long. And some people listen to them all night long. If you missed a show or you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on ThinkTechHawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to ThinkTechHawaii.com slash radio. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or, better yet, sign up on our email list and get the daily newsletter of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact Jay at ThinkTechHawaii.com. Help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us, and we'd like to stay in touch with you. Let's think together. Think Tech now broadcasts more than 30 live talk shows every week. Here are some of the great shows we have. They're all for you, so take a look and join us through the week at thinktechhawaii.com.
like to speak out on an issue or event, you can. We love the First Amendment, and we love hearing from our viewers. You can come down to our speaker's corner and make a video statement on the web. See thinktechhawaii.com. And you can also call in and join our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call in at 415-871-2474 and pose a question or make a comment. Call in. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and volunteer to help us reach Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Damon Cabildo. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.